Welcome to another edition of Give Me Some Truth, Expat Edition. I'm Stan Farmer, and I'm here today with my expat colleague, Syl Michelin, and also with uh, our uh, our special guest from the domestic team uh, and founding partner of Walker Condon, Nate Condon. Uh, Syl? This is uh this is a subject that I get a lot from from my clients abroad, you know. What what are you know, I'm thinking about we've been here for a while. I'm thinking about buying a house in Portugal or you know, I'm thinking about, you know, I've been paying egregious rents in the UK and now I'm going to pay a, a, an egregious price to buy a flat in the UK. <laughs> right. You get a lot of that? Yeah, so it's a topic that comes up a lot. It's this idea of, you know, buying real estate as an American abroad. Like, does it work? Are there issues associated with it? Should I do it? Should I not? Should I think about it differently than if I was in the U.S.? Um, yeah, it's a topic that comes up all the time. Right. And, and, and your standard answer in terms of, is this going to create a tax nightmare for me? No, it shouldn't. Right. Right. So it's pretty straightforward, actually. You can, as an American, buy and own a property abroad. And, you know, there are no major uh, tax concerns associated with it. Right. right. I mean, and surprisingly, it, even less so than most investments. Exactly. Which right? you wouldn't think would be the case. Because we right? spend a lot of time talking about how certain financial investments are very tricky uh, for Americans. Uh, certain foreign financial investments, like, you know, things like mutual funds and things like that. Uh, in the case of real estate, as long as we're talking about direct investments in real estate, um, not only is it pretty simple, but some of the benefits that you would get buying property um, in the U.S. also extend to property that you would own abroad. And uh, an example of that would be um, the capital gains exemption on your primary home that applies here in the U.S. applies in the exact same way to a foreign primary home. Right. So if you live in Germany and you sell a house, you can claim that two hundred and fifty thousand dollar exemption on capital gains on your U.S. taxes. Right. So the the um, or five hundred k for joint or five hundred k for joint filers. So as long as it's it's a primary home, it applies in the exact same way. Right. Which is interesting that you could literally own an ETF and have almost more tax problems. Oh, absolutely. Than owning. Uh, you know, oh. million dollar home. Well, yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and, <laughs> it's just, and, it's, and, it's crazy. And so right. in certain countries, you know, for immigration purposes, you may need to make an investment mm -hmm. in the country, right? Um, if it is buying into an, a real estate fund, sure. That creates tax complications in the United States. It's going to require some extra filings. It's not going to be terribly tax friendly. You're not going to get capital gains treatment right. and so on. But when it comes to direct investment, if that if that investment in the country is buying your own home, right, that works so much better, obviously. And of course, the decision on whether or not to own real estate as a broader investment, it can be quite a bit different for a client than, the, you know, buying your own home to live in, right? So it's a, right. it's an economic and a lifestyle choice, of course. Right? Well, I think, too, the, the highlighting um, just the differences uh, and some of the differences, maybe the, one of the main differences of going through that process for people in a non-U.S. country, because I think the majority of people listening probably have some idea if not um, intimate uh, knowledge of how it works to buy property in the United States. And then when you go abroad, not only is it different, um, it can be, um, there can be things that you need to think about that you, that you may, don't, may not need to think about here in the United States. So we're not saying it's not a bad idea. As a matter of fact, we just stated that it's, it, in, in many cases, can be a great idea. We just need to understand the differences and the nuances to buying um, real estate in, in non-U.S. countries. Well, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, and there are some significant differences, right? And it's hard to generalize because every country is different. But it's true that in many countries around the world, the real estate market is not as 
you know, fluid as it is here in the U.S. It takes longer to close. It's clunkier. There's, uh, you know, more costs involved in closing. Um, and also, I mean, there's something kind of unique about uh, purchasing a home in the U.S. is just the uh, how easy it is to get financing. Sure. Right. Um, and also the quality of the types of loans and the variety of loans that you can get. That's right. So it's not just a so it's just a question of of an extra layer of tax rules that that apply when you own assets abroad. It's you're participating in a completely different banking system. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I, just the so people understand kind of why I'm here. My my background um, is is laden, if you will, with real estate. My father was in real estate. I sold real estate for a number of years, did mortgage loans. Um, so that tends to be my area of expertise when it comes to kind of beyond just the, the stock bond, mutual fund type investments. Did you, did you used to tell couples, what's it going to take to get you in this rambler today? No, but I wanted to. I, I wanted to before my, my real estate career ended. I, but I was my real estate career lasted from uh, age 18 into 22. So <laughs> okay. I was... Uh, uh, probably not in the you know that mind mindset yet. So um, probably then, more business in selling houses than pizza delivery, though. I mean, you talk about a great college job. I mean, it was yeah. a fantastic college job because um, you know I was I was uh, you know, selling for my father's company, so it was it was good in that way. But also, you know, if I if I was able to do one transaction a month, I mean, that's that was some pretty good income for you know a starving college kid. So. Um, but I bring that up because I wanted to talk just briefly about uh, the idea of mortgages and how they're different. I think one one um, uh, kind of oversight that, that a lot of people have is that the U.S. is one of, if not the only country that I'm aware of, uh, a developed country that does 30-year fixed mortgages. Um, are you guys aware of any other country that does 30-year fixed mortgages? I mean, not, directly, no. Not yeah, I, in that I, I kind can't of, think of it. I mean, if mainstream the, way where right. anyone can get access right. to a thirty-year right. mortgage. If and we the, were playing a game show and I had to like, and they said name the other country, yeah, in right. The world, you'd, you'd be, like, <laughs> I'd probably just tighten them. Going, Canada? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, and I don't think that's right. <laughs> right. I don't think Canada it's probably not right. right. Um, uh, so just, just that idea alone, right? So that there's, there's a lot to unpack just with that idea, right? We buy houses here in the United States. We, we get a 30 year fixed or a 15 year fixed. And let's just talk about what we mean by that. That doesn't mean that other countries don't amortize or spread their loans out for 15 or 20 or 30 years. That's actually pretty typical. And the reason why that's typical is because it, it's in our uh, world, the way it sits right now, it's, it's, Pretty much the only way the vast majority of people can own a home because if you amortized it over a five or 10 year period of time, your payments would be $20,000 a month, $50,000 a month. You wouldn't be able to afford that, right? And so the idea behind amortizing loans out for, for longer periods of time makes it affordable for us, but it doesn't necessarily mean that our rate gets to stay exactly the same for that period of time. We're very, very... Um, uh, accustomed to that here in the United States because the vast majority of loans that get taken in the United States are fixed to 50, or excuse me, fixed 15 or fixed 30 year mortgages. In other countries, typically, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, typically they'll fix your rate for what? A period of three years, five years, 10 years, something I mean, like that. You and, see that a lot. Yeah. And then it goes into an mm -hmm. adjustment period based on what the current rates are mm -hmm. at that time when you come out of adjustment. We see There's a lot of that. Come out of that's, yes. that's very common. Yep. In, in yeah. Europe, it's a, it's, you know, it's a lot of LIBOR, which yep. is the London rate. It's it's tied to that plus a, a, a spread, right? Right. Above LIBOR or Eurobor. And that's common to what we know here in the States as, as, as an ARM or an adjustable rate mortgage. Typically, mm -hmm. adjustable rate mortgages here in the United States still have a fixed period, whether it be three years, five years, seven years, and then they adjust yeah. that point or, forward. Or there's a balloon payment, right? And you have to completely True. refinance a new. Exactly. So that that's a balloon mortgage. Uh, same concept, though, the idea that your, your, your payments were based on a much longer period of time and your rate was fixed for a shorter period of time. And the the... The impact that that, ha that that the impact that that can have um, is uh, is almost more than we can talk about today because of the different scenarios you could come up with in terms of what what that means to markets and things like that. However, the market that we're in right now 
and where rates have gone from where they were to where where they are now and where they probably will will remain for a period of time creates some incredible challenges uh especially to people that are in uh, mortgages where their rate is about to adjust oh yeah yes and i think it's a very different discussion that we have with clients when it comes to right. okay how much house can i buy and how right. should i fund it because here in the us okay you can get a 30 year fixed uh it's a very uh, high quality piece of debt to carry on your balance sheet yes you know exactly how much you're you're going to pay uh the terms are pretty straightforward you can repay it whenever you have full flexibility now if you're in a country where you, know, you have effectively a floating rate loan right then that's a lot more risk that you're taking on right. or, or even more so to the point you've been used to a payment on a very low rate which yeah. is the environment we're in now mm-hmm. for a three or four or five year period right. and now all of a sudden guess what and i think that that's yeah. the piece that a lot of people mm-hmm. don't quite understand or they don't have their arms around yet because of what's going on in the rate environment or the, or the bond market last yeah. year yeah so absolutely so it's something to take into consideration, right? Right. So it's a, it's a very different uh, type of loan that you would be taking on, and uh, I think for a long time people took these short term mortgages or even floating rate mortgages, effectively betting on rates continuing to be low for an extended period of time. But as we saw in the last couple of years, um, the risk is very real. Yeah, I, I can. Um call back to my own personal situation when my wife and I bought a house in 2007, I believe. Um, and at that time we took a three year adjustable rate mortgage mm-hmm. and then the, the three years came and went and for probably the next four or five years in a row, yeah. the rate went down <laughs> each year. I mean, I mean, how often do you win in the debt market? Right. We, you know, <laughs> we won in that one. But my concern for people, and it's not just people that, that live abroad, but even people here in the United States, is with what's happened to the interest rate market, I don't know that people fully understand what could potentially happen to their payments you know, when those loans reset in the next year, two years, three years, five years, whatever it might be. I think people are going to be in for quite a shock. And Stan, I know you've been doing a lot of reading on, um, on the European real estate market, and I think there's a lot of, uh, um, we'll say, so-called experts, because I'm not sure how good anybody is an expert of, of predicting the future, but uh, the experts are, are, are quite concerned. Well, I, I just actually was was uh, perusing a 40-page IMF working paper from, from April, right, on the European housing markets and the challenges to uh, the banking systems in Europe. Um, so for the next 45, no, I mean, just, <laughs> yeah, let's read but, the paper and I mean, dissect each this, you know, it kind of reads, it, it, it kind of, it, it kind of reads and I, you know, obviously don't want to sound alarmist, but, um, there is an inflection point here, right? Um, low interest rates led to, um, overvaluation. In, in, in many housing markets. Um, I'm sure in pockets of the United States, of course, but, but you know, you're talking about situation where mortgage rate, uh, like a, on a long-term loan, were like, had a three handle. Yeah. In Europe, some places they had a one handle, right? So uh, the, the IMF uh, is concerned here, obviously, as in 2022, interest rates effectively in the housing market more than doubled um, over Europe on the whole and more than tripled in such countries as Finland, Slovakia, Mm -hmm. Switzerland, and the United Kingdom, right? So uh, when it comes for the next, to the next reset for certain people, when it comes to refinancing that mortgage, the, the interest costs of, of that debt are going to be, you know, phenomenally higher yeah. than they were before because I mean, you know, it, 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 we're still like, you know, if you're, if your rates are one and a quarter and it triples to three and three quarters, well that, I mean, that sounds, it, that, that, that sounds like still like a really attractive rate, but if you stretched to right. afford that, that flat in right. the first place, right. 
holy cow, right? Um, this is going to be this is going to be maximum pain, and it's coming at a time when we've had inflation, which led to interest rates rising in the first place, right? right? So costs of living have gone up for people. Energy costs. There's been an energy crisis in Europe. You know, there's right. some kind of conflict in the the Ukraine, and yeah. you know, um, yeah. So I mean, it, it's uh, it, it's it's a little chilling to think about, you know, it, this is how most bubbles get burst, right? Is right. Overvaluation and then a change of economic conditions. And then, yeah. you know, you don't want to be the last one to the party, right? right. Yeah. yeah, and it means a different um, uh, set of um, circumstances for, for the United States housing market because uh, it's almost um, completely the opposite. Uh, because what we have now is the vast majority of homeowners in the United States that have mortgages are sitting at rates on their current mortgage at uh, a stance of three, three and a quarter, three and a half, whatever it might be, right? Well, now you're looking at it saying, okay, I want to move, right? My family's grown it's or whatever. It's time to upgrade or maybe a downsize or whatever it might be, right? It's time to move. Well, now I have to look at it and go, okay, but if, I've, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to leave my 3% mortgage and I'm going to buy a new home and have a six, six and a half, seven percent right. 7% mortgage. And right. so there's a, a ton of homeowners now that are looking at it saying, maybe I won't leave. Maybe I'll be <laughs> fine. Moving. Maybe I'll right. make this work, right? <laughs> and so you create incredible supply problems here in the United States, inventory problems, because the normal turnover that you would get in the market isn't there anymore and might not be there for a while right. because again, there's a lot of people that are looking at it going, right. I don't, why do I want to leave and, and, and go into, you know, that situation. Sure. So, so that, wanna, that at least keeps the supply demand from, from, you know, a demand crash from killing the market. Right. Cause there's a, at the same time, yeah, a exactly. Supply right, decline, as right, well. and so you have a lot of people then that are going, okay, I'll build a house, right? Because then that becomes like your next best option. And so what we've seen in, in the, some reports, some numbers came out yesterday that that uh, you know housing starts are are you know, picking back up and it's rolling again. And um, the problem there is you, you there's no way that you can outbuild um, your supply problem, your inventory problem. You can't build houses fast enough for the demand that's there. You need you need existing home turnover and, 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 yeah. uh, and transition for that to kind of satisfy the the demand that's out there. But, um, and this transitions us into another area that I wanted to make sure that we get to before, um, we're done today, which is, uh, we, we don't just have to take a mortgage to buy a house. There's different ways that we can finance homes. Uh, we can take withdrawals from brokerage accounts. We can, uh, take what are called securities loans. We can, um, even get into um, other sorts of financing that that are a little bit less uh, kind of fastball down the middle, if you will, to use to use a U.S. term. Um, so, talk just briefly, if you would, about securities loans and kind of what that means, because I know in the in the in the firm um, in the last I don't know, call it twelve months, I think we've used these more than we have. Uh, maybe ever in the in the evolution of the firm. Yeah, they've become more popular as an alternative to mortgages in, yeah. in, in recent years, and part of that is. Because the market's been red hot, and people there's there's bidding wars, and some people like to be cash buyers. Except right. they're not always true cash buyers in the sense that they have the the money in their bank accounts, or maybe they um, do, but they don't want to move it. Exactly right. right. So mm -hmm. an alternative source of financing is to say, well, look, I have a million dollars, um, you know, investment portfolio in stocks and bonds and whatnot, and I'm simply going to ask, you know my broker or financial institution to lend money against those positions. And so you effectively pledge the investment portfolio right. and you get a loan against it. Right. So, you know, the benefits of that is usually that it's very flexible. It's fairly easy to put in place. Very low cost. Very typically it's fairly low cost. There's no big underwriting process. Yep. Um, and so, you know, if you need to have a quick turnaround, and if you need to have, if you need to close on a property without having that um, um, a mortgage um, contingency, uh, contingency, so that that's that, that can be very effective. I don't know if it's necessarily uh, a great long term solution, right? Right, because again, it's not fixed rate and doesn't have a lot of the the benefits that mortgages provide. But oftentimes, as a sort of bridge, as yeah. a short term solution, 
Um, it and it could be, be also efficient. very effective from a tax standpoint because you're not selling the positions. Exactly. So if you're sitting on a lot of capital gains, right. where if you wanted to raise the money by selling positions in your portfolio, you would, you would have to take a huge tax hit. Yeah. By borrowing against the portfolio, um, you, you're not forced to realize gains. Right. You know, and there's one, there's another aspect of besides the lack of a 30 year fixed rate, there's also um, a reason why, even though they're more or less variable mortgages across the world, that the, the, the banking sector, if, if like what we were talking about with rates rising and everything sounds a little bit like the big short, there's, there's probably a, a silver lining for, the banking businesses in Europe. And, and, and I think that would be that they're conservative lenders compared to the U S right. So people are borrowing money, but they're not borrowing 95% right. of the money to buy their house, not from the bank, right. Not for the mortgage. So, sure. you know, and it could potentially create a, a, a huge opportunity within Europe for people that are looking to buy. And, you know, unfortunately there might be a lot of people in the next five years that are forced because of payment changes and things like that to have to sell. This could be an interesting market for, um, you know, buyers. Oh, I mean, certainly. Right. So if you're, uh, if, if you're, if you're listening to this and, and, and interested in the topic because you're, you know, thinking down the line about buying a place, I just remember recently talking to a, a client couple in the Netherlands and, uh, you know, my my advice was, you know, fortunately, something they'd kind of already come to the conclusion that this is a really good time to be on the lookout, mm -hmm. right, uh, for that magic opportunity if there is, you know, yeah. um, a real slide in in market prices, take advantage of the situation because, again, um, just because rates have tripled uh, in in certain areas doesn't mean that they're going to stay that high, you know, going forward. Right. But at the same time, of course, don't don't assume that that they're going down before they re, you know the next reset. Right? right? They could go in the other direction. So you know, always be thinking, you know, what's my ultimate payment pain threshold. And, 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 and like, what's a reasonable expectation if interest rates continue to rise, how high could they pot potentially yep. get and, and buy accordingly? Absolutely. I think that's the, uh, the, the, the key that we want people to walk away with as we wrap up today is just, you know, you, you have an advisor for a reason. Use, you know, the, the people in our firm and the people that you work with. Um, and make sure that you understand uh, all of the implications of your decision before you make that decision, because um, you know it's just a different world than it has been the last, you know, call it dozen years before last year, uh, where it was you know zero next to nothing on interest rates and uh, the risk was just very very low. That's not that's not the case anymore. So, thank you so much for listening to another episode of Give Me Some Truth. And if you have any additional questions or comments, feel free to let us know. And if you like the content here and want to subscribe to the channel, um, please do so. And uh, don't forget to hit that like button. You got it in. But you didn't say smash. That's, that's unfortunate. Walkner Conan Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Registration with the SEC does not imply a certain level of skill or training. The opinions expressed by the participants of this podcast are their own and do not reflect the opinions of Walkner Conan Financial Advisors. All statements and opinions expressed are based upon information considered reliable, although it should not be relied upon as such. Any statements or opinions are subject to change without notice. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Information expressed does not take into account your specific situation or objectives and is not intended as recommendations appropriate for any individual. Listeners are encouraged to seek advice from a qualified tax, legal, or investment advisor to determine whether any information presented may be suitable for their specific situation. Past performance is not indicative of future